Okay, so I think we should start. So it is my pleasure uh, to introduce the first plenary speaker of the conference, Chris Christian Lemon from the University of Erfurt, Emeritus Professor of General and Comparative Linguistics. Professor Lemon has diverse research interests, including linguistic typology, language endangerment and documentation, comparative grammar, diachronic linguistics and the theory of grammaticalization. He has authored and co-authored more than 200 publications and has published in such high profile journals as linguistic typology, linguistics, language, and many other. Today, Professor Lemon will give us a lecture entitled Universals and Types of Body Part Grammar. You can find the link to the presentation in the last version of the, pro of the program on the conference website and in the Google Drive folder. And I will also copy the link in the chat in a minute. Uh, the lecture will last about one hour and then we will have time for questions. And if you want to ask a question to the speaker, don't forget to write your name or simply the word question in the Zoom chat at any time during the talk or during the discussion. Uh, okay, so I think we can start. Okay, let me start. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to this conference and for the presentation. It's a pleasure to talk to you at your annual conference. It's the first time for me. Unfortunately, it's not in presence, but only online. But uh, that may become better in the future. Uh, you are probably seeing this, uh, the window of my presentation. Um, technically, it is uh, an HTML file, uh, and uh, you have uh, the link uh, here on the uh, top line of the window. So if you prefer, uh, you can uh, just click that uh, link and view the presentation yourselves. And um, there's also a paper underlying uh, this presentation. Uh, and. Uh, the last page of this uh, presentation also offers a link uh, to the paper. But now let's get into the topic. Uh, the uh, purpose uh, of my presentation is to compile the set of grammatical constructions conditioned by body part expressions. And uh, I will systematize uh, these constructions on a functional basis. Uh, which means um, the <coughs> overall approach will be onomasiological rather than semasiological. Incidentally, uh, whenever I'm using any uh, terms unfamiliar to you, uh, you can also consult my website. Uh, there is a search function there uh, where you can search for the explication of terms. Uh, and finally, uh, the various constructions uh, will be uh, illustrated uh, from diverse languages. Uh, the entire field of uh, body part grammar, of course, also uh, comprises uh, a lexical and a morphological section, uh, which we'll skip here and uh, focus on syntax. Uh, the paper which I mentioned, uh, you can click here, uh, and it is currently in print. <clears throat> uh, the lexical field of uh, body parts is so central to human life that it has its own grammar, and its elements are often grammaticalized to function in the grammar themselves. Given that uh, body parts constitute a lexical domain, the foundations of body part grammar start from cognitive bases and the exposition takes the onomasiological perspective. Given the onomasiological perspective, body part grammar is heterogeneous in terms of grammatical structure. Uh, the common denominator of all the construction types which will be reviewed is the essential occurrence of a body part in them. So first, let's uh, review some semantic aspects uh, underlying body part grammar. Uh, most body part concepts are relational concepts, 
A hand is generally not conceived as an independent object, but as somebody's hand. Consequently, most body part nouns show properties of relational nouns. The concept body part is a prototypical concept. Prototypical body parts are external parts, which the animate being can control and which have a recognizable contour. From a linguistic point of view, the prototypical body part is not conceived as a part of the body, but as a component of an animate being, thus if a human being of a person. As a consequence, Linda's hand is not simply a part of Linda's anatomy, but something that she has direct control of. Proof of this is that the body itself is generally in the class of body part terms, possessed by the person just like other body parts. The fact that the lexical field also comprises non-prototypical members leads to a certain amount of heterogeneity of the category of body parts. Languages react to it by reserving different grammatical treatment to subclasses of body parts. It is therefore little wonder that simple generalizations of the kind, body part terms are inalienable in language L, such generalizations fail for many languages. A meronymy is a hierarchy based on the part whole relation. The meronymic relation of body parts is susceptible to two interpretations. First, it may be interpreted as a possessive relation, such that the animate being is the possessor of the body part. This relation is asymmetric and typically coded in a possessed nominal with the body part term as its head. Second, it may be interpreted as a sympathetic relation such that whatever affects the part necessarily affects the whole. And what affects the whole necessarily affects one of its parts. This relation is almost symmetric and typically coded by a relation of syntactic fora uh, between the animate being and its body part. The top of the relational hierarchy in body part grammar is the animate being, thus if human, the person. Therefore, the relation of a person to his body part is not actually a part whole relation in the literal sense. We will nevertheless use the abbreviations W for whole and P for part in body part terminology. We come to a chapter on alienability. Uh, the most important feature characterizing and categorizing different possessors is their position on the empathy hierarchy, also known as the animacy hierarchy. It is reproduced here in the diagram. Uh, our W, the whole, is generally higher up on the empathy hierarchy uh, than the part. If the possessum is semantically re relational, then a relation to a certain kind of possessor is inherent in it. And this is then the default interpretation of the nature of the configuration of part and whole. <coughs> <coughs> this is the case of concepts of kinship, body parts, spatial regions, and some others. If the possessum is a body part, the default interpretation of the configuration is that the possessum is a proper part of the possessor's body, thus a meronymic relation. If the possessor is indeed high on the empathy hierarchy, while the possessum is a thing, then the default assumption is that the possessor has control over the possessum. Given an animate being in the universe of discourse, then its body with its parts is given too. If the latter are to be referred to, they need no individuation beyond their possessive relation. 
So this is uh, the reason why in many languages, including my own, uh, if you have a person and uh, his body parts, you don't need a possessive pronoun there. <clears throat> we come to structural reflections of inalienability. The alternative of a possessive relation based on the relationality of the possessum and one not so based is part of the system of many languages in the general form of the alienability contrast. This is in the first place a grammatical strategy of distinguishing two kinds of possessive constructions which may manifest itself at different levels of the linguistic system. One possibility is to lexicalize the distinction in terms of two grammatical categories of nouns. Then as a tendency, relational nouns are inalienable, non-relational nouns are alienable. Another is to mark a possessive construction as alienable or inalienable in total or partial independence from the nature of the concepts of the possessum and the possessor. Structural reflections of inalienability commonly include the following. First, in syntax, the inalienable noun does not occur without a possessive complement or determiner. This requires a compensatory strategy, which is to derelationalize the body part term. This involves an operator which blocks the argument slot of the operand thus converting it into a non-relational notion. Some languages have a morphological operation of derelationalization for inalienable nouns. Look, look, look at example 14 from Tutu Hill. Um, uh, it illustrates that if you have a possessed head, uh, there is uh, no special morphological mark beside uh, the possessive prefix, but if you want to say the head or a head, you need a derelationalizer after following the noun for head. There's also the mirror image operation of relationalization of a non-relational lexeme for use as a head of a possessive construction, uh, and this we'll see in one of the next examples. Second, uh, possessive marking for inalienable nouns is less voluminous than for alienable nouns. Moreover, the structural distance between possessor and possessum is never greater in inalienable than in alienable possession. Both of these generalizations are borne out by the grammar of possession in Mekeo, uh, which is a Papuan language. Uh, example 15 and 16. In the inalienable construction of the former example, the indexes are directly suffixed to the possessum, u and mu, while the alienable construction of example 16 requires a relationalizer that the possessive indexes are suffixed to. And this is the initial e here. The possessive suffixes remain the same, as you can see. We come to possessive classes. Semantic relationality is to be distinguished from inalienability. The former is inherent in certain concepts independently of their linguistic coding. The latter is a grammatical property of certain nouns or constructions. It may be semantically arbitrary to a greater or lesser extent, just like gender and noun classes may have a semantic basis in certain languages, but may comprise members whose grammatical categorization is arbitrary from a semantic point of view. The most vital body parts are at the same time those that can be controlled by their possessors. Several languages grammaticalized a subdivision of body part terms whose semantic basis is this distinction of control. 
if the language has actor and undergoer indexes on the verb, then there may be a different possessive index on the noun according to the possessor's control. In such a situation, the actor indexes of the verb are used in controllable possession. This is the case in Mohawk. Please look at examples 19 and 20. Uh, plus minus controllable is grammaticalized as minus plus alienable. Mohawk has different paradigms of possessive prefixes, namely undergoer prefixes for alienable nouns, like here, undergoer, first singular, and actor prefixes for inalienable nouns. In the A example, the noun denotes an inalienable body part and some other body parts, including hair, skin, and internal organs like the heart, bear the undergoer prefix. Yucatec Maya in examples 21 and 22 has a set of possessive classes into which nouns are classified according to their grammatical behavior when they function as the possessum of a possessed nominal and outside such a construction. Body part nouns are in three of these classes, two of which are exemplified in these examples. My mouth is in T. Uh, the, the mouth or that mouth is not sayable. Uh, on the other hand, uh, my liver is in thumbnail with a relational suffix. And that liver or the liver is uh, le tamno without the relational suffix. So one possessive class, namely this one, uses a relationalizer in the possessed nominal. And on the other hand, uh, uh, there are such inabsoluble body parts uh, like the mouth, uh, and these can uh, designate controllable body parts. Naturally, the liver is not controllable, but the mouth is. Last part of uh, the semantic prerequisites, uh, the spatial and instrumental functions of body parts. Uh, because typical body parts are essentially determined by these two functions. They bear a meronymic relation to their next inclusive whole and bear contiguous spatial relations to each other. And second, uh, they are controlled by their whole and may serve it as an instrument. Both of these functions are prominent in body part constructions. And now we come to the main chapter of this presentation. Uh, we will be reviewing body part constructions in uh, diverse languages. First, the basic construction types. Uh, we are talking about constructions dedicated to body part terms. Uh, they are systematized in these three uh, main categories. Uh, the first distinction to be made is between constructions that are exclusively devoted to the possessive relation contracted by a body part term and such constructions which although integrating a body part term, do not focus on its possessive relation, but rather somehow accommodate it or even neglect it at the level of grammatical structure. The former constructions are concerned with attribution of the possessive relation to either the body part or its possessor. The latter constructions are again subdivided by the criterion of the function of the body part term vis-a-vis -vis the pr predication. Because it may simply be the subject of a predication that attributes some property to it, or else it may have some participant role in a more dynamic situation. And these are the roles uh, that may be assumed by the whole, abbreviated by W, as you remember, uh, and uh, the part abbreviated by P. So the first subchapter is 
attribution of possession. <coughs> a semantically based classification of the principal constructions which attribute a possessive relation to one of its two terms may be achieved by two independent criteria. First, by the criterion of the direction of attribution of the possessive relation. Either the possessor or the possessum is the bearer of this attribution. Let me use the term bearer uh, of an attribution for that argument of the relation that the relation is attributed to. You will see in a moment what that means. And the other criterion is uh, the propositional function. Uh, the possessive relation is either presupposed in a reference or it is being predicated. Uh, these two criteria produce uh, the cross classification, which you see uh, in the table. Uh, so in reference, we have uh, a possessed nomin nominal WSP uh, or uh, a propriative nominal a W provided with P. And in predication, we have uh, the predication of belonging, P belongs to W or P is W's, uh, or an ascription of possession, W has P. Uh, these four constructions are illustrated in uh, examples eight and nine. So here you have a possessed nominal, uh, here you have the um, predication of uh, belonging, uh, here you have uh, the propriative nominal, and here you have the ascription of possession, which in English uses have. So let's start with uh, the section where the part is the bearer of the possessive relation. If the possessor is attributed to the possessum in a predication, this may be coded in a variety of constructions among them P is W's or P belongs to W or P is to W. The availability of any of these is generally constrained by the possessum's alienability. In Yucatec Maya appearing in examples 29 and 30, a predication of belonging instantiates the schema P is W's. It consists of the possessum in subject function and a possessed nominal in predicate function. The letter's head is a formative glossed as property, which functions as a dummy possessum and takes the possessor as its complement, U and uh, the nominal possessor following here. Example 29 shows uh, that this generic construction is also used for alienable body part terms, in this case, uh, the feather. Things are different with inalienable body part nouns in the position of the possessum in a predication of belonging, uh, like the head here. If possible at all, they are interpreted as referring to a detached body part typically of an animal that serves as food. Next, the whole is the bearer of the possessive relation. Again, examples from Yucatec. If an ascription of possession is to be predicated of the possessor, again, a variety of schemata become available cross-linguistically. Most widespread are existential constructions. These come in two variants. One dissociates possessor and possessum syntactically, like uh, to W there is a P, or uh, on W there is uh, a P, uh, like uh, as in Russian. And as an example, uh, 31, um, we will come to it in a moment. But uh, the other strategy I mentioned before uh, combines uh, the two terms in a possessed nominal. It says WSP exists. And um, 
Uh, this is illustrated in the other two examples here. So let's first uh, look at example 12, uh, at example 31. Inessential body parts are straightforwardly used as characteristics of their possessors. So uh, the man who is a has a scar literally says uh, uh, the man uh, that there exists a scar to him. Uh, by contrast, ascription of possession of a thing to a possessor that possesses that thing inherently was at times declared ungrammatical in linguistics. Uh, examples like uh, the girl has a leg and so on. Such constructions are not ungrammatical. They just require special conditions to make sense. Uh, so let's first look at example 34. Possession of a vital body part may be ascribed to an entity if a possessive relation to this particular kind of possessor is not inherent in the body part concept. So this example comes from a natural text. The stones have ears, the trees have ears. And it says uh, uh, there are its ear to a stone, uh, there is its ear to a tree. And the other case is a possession of a vital body part may be ascribed to its natural possessor. And then the Gricean maxim of relation may be relied upon for interpretation. This happens in the last example, 35. Uh, literally, uh, really, he has ear, well, which means he has fine ears. although Shikin is an inalienable body part. Next chapter, how do we ascribe a property to a body part? Vital body parts can be used freely to characterize their possessor only if they have a salient property of their own. A proposition coding this involves by definition two relations, the possessive relation between the body part and its whole, and the predicative relation between the body part and its characteristic. Only one of them can become the main predication in the proposition. This generates the following alternative in the syntactic construction of such a proposition. A, the construction has a possessed nominal as the bearer of the ascription and the characteristic as its predicate, as example 38. Or B, the construction has W as the bearer of an ascription of possession and the body part bearing the attribute in the predicate, as in uh, example, B. So either Linda's legs are long or Linda has long legs. Just as in possessive predications, an important factor in the choice between the two constructions is alienability. If inalienability of a body part term in a language requires its marking by a possessive pronoun or index, then the adnominal possessor construction A is obligatory. Construction B, <coughs> on the other hand, is typical of languages where alienability is not grammaticalized at the noun phrase level and which consequently have no problem with ascribing possession of a vital body part to a W if it has a property. So first, uh, body part is bearer of ascription. Again, an example from Yucatec. In this language, there's no way of ascribing W possession of an inalienable body part, whether the latter bears a characteristic or not, with the exception of such uh, special cases as we saw before. Therefore, characterization of a body part presupposes its position as the head of a possessed nominal as illustrated in example 38. So in English one says uh, the girl has long legs, 
uh, but in Yucatec one says long are the legs of the girl. And uh, on the other hand, whole is the bearer of ascription. Construction B above is a variant, variant of the ascription of possession to the possessor, namely the variant where uh, the part to be ascribed to the whole is provided by its own attribute. The French instance of it, illustrated by example 41, is instructive. Uh, the crucial difference between this construction and a simple ascription of possession resides in the definiteness of P. It indicates that the existence of the P on this W is presupposed. Thus, the point of the predication is not the ascription of possession to, uh, of P, but the specific property of this P. In addition to these patterns inherited from the ascription of possession, there is a construction which ascribes the property to W in a copular clause as an example 48. Uh, Sylvie est jolie des yeux, but literally, uh, uh, Sylvia is pretty of the eyes. Here, the predication ascribes the property to the whole instead of the part, adjoining the part in a kind of in a kind of limitative attribute. This really means with respect to the eyes. Okay, now we come to the largest uh, chapter, uh, namely uh, the various participant roles of body parts and wholes. Uh, first, uh, about the semantosyntactic configurations that we have to take in account. Given a proposition with two arguments, W and P, which bear a possessive relation to each other, but this is not being predicated, then the proposition is about some situation which is not essentially possessive. This means that each of these arguments is the bearer of two cognitive roles, its role in the possessive relation and the participant role in the situation. Commonly, only one of the two relations for each participant is coded, leaving the other to inference. It's of course possible to code both relations in one clause, but uh, we leave out this case. In order to understand the grammatical treatment of W and P in different configurations, uh, two linguistic hierarchies have to be presupposed. Uh, the empathy hierarchy, which we saw before, and a hierarchy of argument functions. This diagram here comprises semantosyntactic functions of the status of macro roles like actor, undergoer, indirectus, and place on the same level of instrument. And finally, the possessor. Uh, the indirectus is the macro role taken by a participant high on the empathy hierarchy that the situation extends to. Since control is not the crucial parameter for this role, it figures prominently in situations in which the two uppermost functions of the diagram, diagram are taken by other participants. If there is a valency position for the indirectus, it is the indirect object. If the language has a dative, the indirectus is marked by it. The whole may either control the situation or be controlled by it. Depending on this, W either takes the actor role or one of the lower roles in the diagram. The most important factor to determine P's role in the situation is then its sympathetic relation to W. Since a, in a possessive relation, W is higher on the empathy hierarchy than P, Syntactic processes which are sensitive to empathy will give preferential treatment to W on the hierarchy of argument functions. In this diagram, possessor designates the macro role of a noun phrase that directly depends on a nominal head in a possessed nominal. 
So it's not the generic semantic role of a possessor in a possessive relation, but that semantosyntactic macro role more specifically. The two sets of basic functions available to the part and to the whole in a clause constitute the criteria of the cross classification of this table here. The cells are filled with schematic representations of the functional configuration. The configurations crossed out are assumed to be non-existent. So we'll come stepwise to all of these construction types. Uh, so where um, the whole is the possessor, we have situation involves uh, WSP or um, situation happens on WSP or uh, if uh, the uh, possessor is a kind of instrument, then it happens by WSP. And uh, the other construction formulas are to be in, understood in the same way. With the examples, I think the formulas will get clearer. The last row of, table, of the table has W itself in actor function. In the configurations of the upper rows, there may or may not be an actor in addition to the rows used for classification. In the construction formulas of the following subsections, such an additional actor will appear as an optional component which does not affect the essence of the construction. Unless both the possessor and the participant of W are coded, the following alternative presents itself. The possessive relationship is either coded in a possessed nominal involving the two terms. Uh, this is the first line here. Or it is not specifically coded. This is the case in the subsequent lines. The alternative of coding or not coding uh, W's possessor role is all but exclusive for quite a few languages. One subset of languages always codes W's possessor role and leaves its participant role to an inference based on its sympathetic relation to the part. Uh, and the parts function is then coded. The other subset of languages codes W's participant role and leaves its possessor role to an inference based on P's relationality. So we come to the first line here, W is possessor. You see the construction formula again here on top uh, and the X with the index A is uh, the optional additional actor, which I mentioned before and which is inessential for the constructions. This construction has been called internal possessor construction in contrast with the further constructions, which have been the external possessor construction. We will come to this later. So first, the whole is possessor of the undergoer. If body part terms are strictly inalienable, then the language will prefer the ad nominal possessor construction. Properties, states, and processes which are relevant to a body part are then not attributed to the animate being as a whole, but directly, <coughs> excuse me, to its body part. Yucatec goes to a, a remarkable extremes with this strategy. I mentioned that uh, it has to specify uh, the possessor of inalienable body parts. Even in situations like uh, 58, where somebody is hanging himself, colonial Yucatec limits itself to coding impingement on the body part. Uh, literally, he said he would tie his neck, leaving the effect on the whole uh, to an inference. And second, the whole is possessor of a local dependent. P may have the function of a local dependent. This is illustrated in example 61 uh, for a situation without extra and in the following example 
for a situation with an actor. You know that, uh, for instance, this situation is coded very differently in different languages. Next, and now the whole is affected. The sympathetic situation may be defined as follows. There are two participants, P and W, which are in a meronymic relation. P is prototypically a body part. W is the animate possessor of the part. The situation is some kind of impression or impingement on P. By virtue of their sympathetic relation, the situation affecting P extends to W. The affectedness or involvement of the whole may essentially be coded in two syntactically contrasting ways. Either W is coded as an indirectus, typically marked by a dative case, but occasionally by an applicative derivation of the verb, or else W is coded as an undergoer, typically in one of the functions of absolutive or intransitive subject or direct object. These are the two rows of the following table. Whether an affected W is coded as indirectus or as undergoer, there are two possibilities for P, the column entries here. It can be coded as undergoer or as local dependent. The four resulting combinations are shown in the table, which is a segment of the previous table. So the situation affects P to W or the situation extends to W on P. And if uh, the whole is the undergoer, then the situation affects W to wit P or namely P or situation affects W on P. So let's first see the case where W is indirectus. Um, in body part constructions, uh, the indirectus role is always taken by W. P cannot be indirectus. So first, W is indirectus, uh, P is undergoer. The most recent label for the construction is external possessor construction. This implies that the construction codes W's possessive function. However, the construction is only found in languages which possess an indirectus macro role independently of possession. What is coded is therefore W's indirect involvement or affectedness. The possessive relation is an inference. In some languages, one or both of the constructions which feature W as a verb dependent have an alternate ad nominal possessor construction. If there is a choice, a semantic contrast is possible. The ad nominal possessor strategy concentrates on P's direct involvement and consequently backgrounds W. The indirect strategy is based on the fact that by virtue of the sympathetic relation, a situation affecting P extends to W. It codes W's involvement and consequently moves it to the foreground. Here is an example without actor. Uh, some lang languages already, as already mentioned, present a choice between the indirectus and the ad nominal possessor construction. Uh, in example 70, a first person pronoun is coordinated with a possessor phrase in the genitive. Here it may be assumed that the empathy hierarchy controls the choice between the indirectus and the possessive construction. Personal pronouns prefer the former, lexical noun phrases prefer the latter. The next example is with an external actor. If there is an actor distinct from W, this will generally be coded as transitive subject or ergative accent. In ancient Greek, W then generally appears in the dative, as in this example. 
the B version is possible, but uh, subject to constraints. Here the W is in the genitive. Next, whole is indirect, this part is local dependent. Example 76 illustrates the location of an object in a body part. Uh, to me, there's a lantern in the hand. And uh, the next example, 78, uh, features an external actor. Uh, they threw themselves at Caesar's feet. Caesari ad pedes, Caesari indirectus. Next, <coughs> the whole is undergoer. There is a construction where both W and P are coded as undergoers. The double undergoer construction reflects the sympathetic relation between part and whole. That is, the fact that what affects the part in many cases affects the whole in like fashion. First, without an actor, given the situation in which uh, the pair of P and W are affected, then if the predicate is intransitive, there, so there's no actor, at least one of the former two will become subject of the clause. So here you have the double subject construction. One possibility is uh, the double subject construction shown in example 82 from Yavuru, Australia. The verb agrees uh, with uh, W, although its selection restrictions clearly refer to the part. Mm -hmm. My heart is beating hard, uh, but here the auxiliary agrees with the first person. If despite the absence of an actor, the verb is transitive, then W may be coded as subject and P as direct object. However, W is not the actor, but the undergoer of the situation. Example 87 shows that both the indirectus and the nominal possessor construction are possible with what appears to be the same body part. So French can say, uh, je me suis cassé la, la jambe with an indirectus, or uh, j'ai cassé ma jambe uh, with a possessive attribute. However, there are two semantic differences between the two versions. Uh, first, uh, the B version would not normally refer to the speaker's vital leg. The translation given is one of the emergency interpretations imaginable for such a sentence. Second, the active construction of a transitive verb, as in the B version, implies a controlled act, while the reflexive construction of A implies unintentionality. We are coming to the uh, double object construction uh, from what I also situated in Australia. I hit the man on the head. You see the head in absolutive and the man in absolutive. That is unmarked case. A construction very similar to this one illustrated by the next example is found in ancient Greek. Nidosetas se is accusative and tas heiras is accusative too. Uh, this is an essentially synonymous variant uh, of an example we saw before with the indirectus. However, here we apply a passivization test and then uh, the animate whole uh, becomes uh, a subject. So this is here the direct object while the part remains in the accusativus respectus. Mm? So, with respect to the hands. The default situation in what appears to be a double object construction is probably uh, that uh, W is actually the direct object, while P is in some ill-defined secondary object function. Next, whole is undergoer, part is local dependent. Uh, 
here's the configuration. This construction expresses that uh, W is affected on P. If there is no actor, W will normally become subject, just as in the double undergoer construction. So I have pain in the eyes. I am subject here. <clears throat> the ablative specifies the source and thus conceivably the cause of the sentiment. This configuration also allows for the presence of an actor. This is illustrated in 97. Here again, you have the part in the ablative. This construction has sometimes been tackled with the transformational notion of possessum demotion. However, again, it must be said, the, uh, the, dis the construction does not code possession. The possessive relation is an inference based on P's semantic relationality. Now, last line of the table, as you may remember, the whole is an actor. First whole is actor, part is undergoer. Uh, the purest realization of this schema is found in constructions signifying that W controls its P in a typical way. Some European languages then normally or even obligatorily lack the possessive pronoun on P. As you can see here, you opened your eyes. In English, you say your eyes. In Latin and, and incidentally in German, you say you opened the eyes. The same thing in Greek. Uh, the typical situation for an animate being uh, affecting its own body part is in grooming, as an example in 105. The reflexive relation inherent in such, a rela in, in such a situation is coded by the middle voice in ancient Greek, as illustrated by example 105. The body part term here is, again, in the accusativus respectus, hmm? I get washed with respect to the hands. Again, whole is actor, but now part is instrument. Since body parts are inanimate, they do not naturally function as agents. Instead, what would be an, an inanimate agent is normally treated as an instrument. This is the most natural active role of body parts in a situation. W is then normally the actor in this situation, as an example, 106 from in German, Linda snapped her finger, but in German it is with the finger. <clears throat> and uh, whole is actor, part is local dependent. Uh, here the uh, part is again an instrument, but it is nevertheless often coded in a local function is here in the example 109 from Mayali. I touched uh, the woman with my hand, but Mayali doesn't say with my hand, it uh, says from the hand. <clears throat> okay, here is something uh, new, namely up to now we have seen uh, the whole and the part in different syntactic or functions or in different macro roles. And now we'll see a series of examples where they are assigned analogous functions. A sympathetic situation gives rise to syntactic constructions in which W and P have analogous syntactic functions. The present section summarizes those previous subsections where W and P are coded in the same function or are at least marked by the same case. Warbiri is a language of which, for which the entire gamut of analogous functions is documented. So that's why all of the examples are from Warbiri. You are liable to step on the dog's tail. Here, the dog and the tail are in the absolutive. Next, I grab the dog by the tail with my hand. Uh, this example is doubly complicated because on the one hand, uh, you have uh, my hand, 
both in the uh, eye and hand in the absolutive, but then the dog, since the verb is intransitive here, sees um, the dog in the dative and the tail in the dative. Uh, then uh, the ant is crawling into the child's ear, uh, ear allative and child allative. And finally, the child is striking me with its hand, the child in the ergative and the hand in the ergative. I use the expression analogous syntactic function, but this requires a comment. Uh, the morphological marking for syntactic function, uh, namely the case, is the same for W and for P. However, whenever the behavioral properties of these two syntactic components are analyzed thoroughly, subtle differences appear. First, pronominal indexes of the verb or auxiliary which cross-reference the bearer of the syntactic function in question refer to W, not to P. This is visible in uh, the examples. And second, when a clause with double object is passivized, W and not P becomes the subject. This proves that it is W which actually bears the syntactic function in question. P is only an extension of W. P bears a relation of syntactic for A to W, which although semantically based only on the sympathetic relation rather than on strict co-reference, licenses agreement in case marking. The semantosyntactic relation between the two may be paraphrased by W to wit P. This also explains why in languages which generally have very free word order like uh, Walbiri, P in this construction generally comes after W. I may need a little more uh, than the minutes left to me, but not too much. Please bear with me. Last subchapter here, incorporation of body part term. <clears throat> a body part term uh, and noun may be incorporated in the verb while its W bears some act and function vis-a-vis -vis the verb. Such incorporative constructions may be classified according to the semantic functions played in the clause by the incorporated body part noun P and its possessor W. The following configurations of table two are relevant here. First, the situation affects the whole, whether or not there is an actor, that is whole is undergo. And second, the whole controls the situation affecting P or using it as an instrument. That will be the next slide. So first whole is undergoer. Uh, this is the incorporative variant of the double undergoer construction. Uh, first, uh, the variant without an actor illustrated by 117, I cracked my ribs. Uh, literally, I rib cracked. In a sympathetic situation with an actor occupying the subject or ergative function, incorporation of P frees the direct object or absolutive function for W. This may be illustrated from Tupi Namba, an example 120 and the following. I washed his face. Here you have face as the direct object or I face washed him. And as you observe, uh, the undergoer prefix differs in the two versions uh, because in the B version, uh, it refers to an animate being. The construction with a part as local dependent has an incorporative variant too. In example 121, W still has undergoer function coded as subject while P is incorporated. My uh, right eye hurts. The eye, if it were an external accent, would be in the locative. The attribute has not been incorporated with a noun and remains in the locative in situ. Now the incorporative construction with whole as actor, part is undergoer, 
from Yucatec, I rushed through the examples in order not to overdraw too much. Uh, here you have open mouth. Uh, the mouth would be the direct object. Here it is incorporated. And uh, the incorporative version means he tattled. Um, the same from what I, I nearly cut my hand. I nearly hand cut. And finally, whole as actor, part as instrument. Beside the incorporation of body part nouns in undergoer function, the second most important function in which they are incorporated when W is actor is as instruments. In Yucatec Maya, the base verb of this construction is transitive as illustrated by the example 127. Uh, I prick uh, the boy with my hand. And now in B, the hand is incorporated. Uh, I prick hand the boy. Here the incorporated noun designates a body part of the actor of the situation serving him as an instrument. The valency and selection restrictions of the verb do not change by this process. Among body parts, the construction is restricted to inalienable body parts that is the ones which may be controlled by their possessors. This pattern is fully productive and semantically regular in Yucatec. I'm coming to the conclusions. Body parts are conceptualized in typical ways which shape the grammar of expressions which talk about them. The most important of their properties which manifest themselves in grammatical constructions are the following. First, the relationality of a body part term may be taken up in language structure in two opposite ways. A, it may be reflected in morphological structure by an obligatory indexing of the whole in a possessive construction. And B, since the whole is necessarily co-present in the situation, the rel relationality of the part may be taken as a sufficient basis to infer the whole. You see this interesting because these two consequences are practically opposite. Second, a body part bears a relation of consubstantiality as it has been named to its whole. This determines its partaking in situations in which the whole is involved. A, if a property is attributed to a part, then the whole is characterized by this property of its part. Consequently, the property may be ascribed either to the whole or to the part. B, if the whole controls the situation, its part will typically serve as an instrument. C, if the part is affected by the situation, the whole is affected too. This founds a sympathetic relation between them. There are various syntactic strategies of coding the two undergoer roles. D, if a component of the situation is located with respect to the part, it is also located with respect to the whole. And finally, the above are default roles of a body part in a situation. As a consequence, the grammatical strategies for coding the relevant functions may be less sumptuous than for other kinds of objects in the same functions. Thank you very much for your upheld interest and attention. There are also indications of the sources of the language data, bibliographical references, and uh, a list of abbreviations used in the glosses. They are all found in the article, which you can click here. And now I'm at your entire disposal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have uh, about six minutes for questions. And there's uh, a question by Maxim. Uh, yeah. uh, thank you so much for the lecture. Um, it was very clarifying for the field of possessive relations. Uh, I would like to ask some, uh, some questions. I think it was around slide number 13. 
there were two French examples. And uh, yes, thank you. Uh, so I actually, I'm, I'm not sure I quite understand the analysis. Uh, if Even if we think that in example 41, we have, um, am I right that it is analyzed as some sort of depictive, right? I have sort the, of what, please? De depictive, uh, well, um, a secondary predicate. So I have the hair black. Yeah. It's not not a single noun phrase, but a separate um, adjectival phrase that uh, is a secondary predicate, right? Uh, um, but are you are you sure about this? You would have to test that by moving noir to a different place, of course. Yes. Uh, okay. It's possible. If, 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 mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if it is not the case, then it is a single noun phrase, right? Le cheveu yeah. noir. But in this case, why would it be a a case of uh, description of property to um, to whole? Or it is just for the reference on this slide? Um, the whole is the bearer of the ascription because he is uh, the subject and there's a have predication which assigns him uh, the hair. Um, but uh, in a certain sense, uh, the construction is uh, not very iconic because what you want to say is uh, that the hair are, hairs are black. Uh, it should be an attribution of noir to cheveux. Uh, and this would be the case if you are right that this is some sort of secondary predication syntactically. If it is, uh, then yes. And otherwise, it's just a, a non iconic strategy. Ah, okay. I see. I see. Thank you. And uh, the second one, um, I think it was okay. Uh, Yes, I uh, I remember. I wanted to ask if uh, the second uh, construction is possible with uh, um, adjectives that cannot be used in relation to a person, like black, for example, or I don't know, long. Uh, uh, yeah, as far as I know, no, not. Mm -hmm. So, so it, it's actually both uh, the, both uh, whole and part are being ascribed some prettiness in this uh, semantically, right? Uh, and that's right, yeah. Um, the uh, construction is not totally counter iconic, I would say, although what you want to say is uh, that the eyes are pretty. Uh, if the girl has pretty eyes, then she is at least pretty mm -hmm. in that respect. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Is there any other question? We still have Andre. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for your lecture. Uh, my question is, uh, did you take into account in your study metaphoric or, or idiomatic uses of body part terms? Um, there, uh, the, the paper that the presentation is based on uh, is four times uh, as long as the presentation. And uh, there's also a subsection on idiomatic expressions. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Maxim? Yes, me again, if I may. I also had some, um, some speculation about what I think is on slide 14. Uh, there was a table with, uh, yes, with the um, calculus of what is possible, right? But uh, here we could also imagine a column uh, which would be named process C, right? And which could uh, incorporate things like um, situation, well, um, dub, uh, W with P is doing something like uh, appropriative expressions. Uh, a man with a knife, uh, I know, uh, is 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 running. Um, mm -hmm. 
is, is it not here just because in these cases it is always just about the whole and never uh, in yeah. any okay that's that's the reason uh, in such sentences i would assume uh, assume that uh, the part uh, has only one role, uh, namely being possessed uh, by W and does not have a participant role. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the uh, first line, we have at least some cases when, uh, although syntactically, it, syntactically it's so, but uh, the possessor is the possessor is also somehow affected. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Thank. You. Okay, I think we should stop unless the organizers say differently. So thank you once again. And, and thank you everyone for participating. We'll see you again we're, tomorrow. <laughs> we're meeting tomorrow at 11. Bye. Goodbye.